do something <laughs> today that maybe we don't usually do. I'm, I'm going to pick on the counselors a little bit, okay? So let me ask you guys this as counselors. How many of you guys sitting here as counselors are doing what you thought you were going to do when you first started college? So I want to hear everyone. So it's kind of a yes or no, and you're welcome to expand it a little bit. Like, when you went into college, when you were, you know, kind of just all fresh and everything out of high school, and you had four, five, six years ahead of you, you don't really know, is what you're doing now what you went into college desiring and intending to do? Want to start with my right? No. Answer is no. <laughs> no. Okay. No. Oh, it's a yeah. long answer. <laughs> oh, was it windy for you uh, to, to be? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. yes, Wendy. Uh, okay. Uh, I have like maybe like 10 to 20 career changes. Oh, that's it? Yeah. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. I <laughs> <didn't have laughs> really how do you fit that in? It's <laughs> amazing. Uh, no, I'm like, how do you fit Yeah, within that's four it. years. Uh, wow, that's, that's. I mean, with all of them, like the same major. Sure. So. But kind of like all these different ideas in your head. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I went in pre med and then some of the pre health and then another pre health. A lot of priests. And then I was like, no, I'm going to teach science to a little kid. And then I tried it and I was like, no. <laughs> and okay. Then, and, then, and then another pre health and then a pre health. And I was like, no, I'm just going to quit school. I want to go to Bible college. <laughs> and then I didn't do that. Okay. And then no, I'm not pre health. <laughs> okay. And one of these days we're going to hear and learn about what you actually do. Okay, and Dora, you. How was your journey? <laughs> I didn't know where Chino Hills was, but they decided they wanted to plant a church. So I went to Matt's staff, but my dream was to go to UCLA. So God did grant that later on, but it took some time. My goal was actually to um, be a teacher. I think all my life, I think from kindergarten, it was either to be a nurse or to be a teacher, mm -hmm. because I wanted to take care of people. <laughs> um, so I think what I do now, I'm in HR, it, it is kind of like that, I take care of my employees, but... No, it didn't start out like that. Okay. But, yeah, I went into teaching, but realized, like, actually, I don't want to deal with crazy kids. But I deal with crazy adults now, so I don't know if that's <laughs> 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 So would you say it was windy as well? <laughs> would, you, would you say it was windy as well, or it was just more? <laughs> but I definitely, like, had, I definitely, I mean, since college, I've had, you know, four or five different jobs. Okay. To get to where I, okay. I mean, well, like, even within HR, to get to where I'm at. Right? Okay. So, the answer is no. Okay, gotcha. All right, so then to my left, Mr. Volunteer. How about you? Who, who is in the middle straddling two things right now? Uh, I don't know what I want to do when I was in college. Or, yeah, I just went into computer science because I didn't know what else to do. And then, and in college, I actually wanted to go to seminary afterwards. But that didn't happen right away. And I ended up just looking for one job after another. And not even too sure what kind of computer science job to get. I just knew I had that major. And I didn't really like actually programming. <laughs> so I just kept applying and finally ended up at library. I ended up working there. And then the whole desire of wanting to go to center never went away. <clears throat> so there I am. And then there you are. <laughs> okay. um, was it windy? I don't think mine was as windy. Okay. But I would say that like I was very lost in what I want, what God wanted me to do. Mm. Okay. Okay, me too. All right. So let's <laughs> let's move on from that. Okay. Um, the reason I want to bring that up is because I I feel like you know as you guys are in college, a lot of times uh, it's very hard to even see beyond maybe the next semester. Uh, you know, not to mention what life would be like. You know, after the college education. But I mean, as you can see by these, you know, three counselors that th there was a life after and, and there was a journey that God has taken them on and, and so on and so forth that every season then we continue to trust. Well, if we're only talking about four years there, five or six, depending on, then imagine, you know, when, you know, we hear about, you know, what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to trust him. And, and that it's not only our every season, but it's our entire life. And then it's also then trusting him for eternal life. And so along the way, I mean, it wouldn't be questionable or strange to think, you know what? Man, there's, there's going to be times in which I just don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to have doubts. 
Yeah, am I even going to finish? I mean, to those of you getting baptized this time, you're, you're taking a step of obedience. You know, this is part of the Great Commission in disciple making is that you identify publicly with God's people and that you follow Christ with God's people and commit to the local church. This is a major step. But this is just the beginning. Imagine at your age, this could be where the next 60 years of your life is actually what your Christian life past this point is going to look like. And you probably have no idea what's going to happen. And so at this point, for many of us, it could be where you have all kinds of doubts and all kinds of questions. And maybe you're wondering, am I even going to finish? You know, I know the gospel. I know God's promises. I know that the redemption of sin, the redemption of sinners, that's the work of Christ. I trust in him. We're going to celebrate this Good Friday and Easter. But really, are we going to finish? And I think that's a very legitimate question. Because also, the older you get, what you'll find is that oftentimes the people that you, at some season, journeyed in following Christ with, by their profession, you know, by your understanding, that maybe people have chosen to go in a different direction. So there are people that have not finished or are choosing not to finish this journey with Christ. And so knowing how unpredictable life already is through every season, knowing how fickle we sometimes are and our hearts are and the things that we want are, what hope do we have that when the Bible speaks of an eternity in heaven with our Redeemer face to face forever, that we would look forward to that with an actual and practical dependence and hope where we actually believe that, you know what, we will get there and not just kind of crossing our fingers going, well, you know, yeah, hopefully it works out. You know, hopefully I'm with the right church. Hopefully, you know, I, I don't go astray. Hopefully I, you know, keep the right friends, but I just don't know. Who knows? And so this is how I wanted to have us thinking as we're coming to the end of this opening benediction, which is a prayer of blessing that, that Paul gives to introduce uh, Ephesians, is because we've covered now two parts where in the very beginning we saw how God the Father, in eternity past, had ordained and to predestine a group of people for himself that then he will adopt into his family. And why adoption? Because we are not like him. We are not in that sense then biologically connected to him. We're born sinners. We're not like God, but his image is in us. And so what he has decided to do from before the foundation of the world is that he will choose a group of people to save and to love and to adopt into his family through their faith in Jesus Christ. So this has happened, and this was the very first part of the benediction, this prayer of blessing. And then we saw then Gabe preached on how Christ is the source of our redemption. He's the means by which our sins could be forgiven. And if our hope and trust is in him, he is the centerpiece of God's plan for bringing about not only individual and personal restoration and revival and salvation, but for the entire universe, that as God continues to work through his plan that he has set aside or set apart from before the foundations of the world, that it is centered around Christ who brings everything together. So then today we're going to look at the last four verses of this benediction, which is kind of broken up into two smaller parts. And each of these parts is going to focus on a particular identity that you have in Christ that then I'm going to encourage you guys to hold on to this. Hold on to this identity of being an adopted heir and hold on to this identity of being a redeemed saint. And both of these identities, if you cling to them, then in the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work in you as a Christian, you will finish. And it's not because you're so great or that you were just fortunate to be in the right place at the right time, but it's because this is how God will bring glory to himself, that you will finish because you are an adopted heir and because you are a redeemed saint. So I'm going to go ahead and actually read the entire benediction because I love it. There's something about hearing this in its entirety, and then we'll go ahead and just focus on the last four verses like I mentioned. Okay. So um, I don't have this up here. Just go ahead and listen or look in your Bibles. I'm, reach I'm reading from the ESV. Ephesians 1, starting from verse 3. Paul speaking here, a prayer of blessing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, 
which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Remember, he's the centerpiece, okay? As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of of his glory. So the first two verses are going to be looking at how we are adopted heirs. Interestingly enough, this idea of adoption was brought up in the first section, wasn't it? Where the father had planned and ordained and predestined a group of people that then he will save and that he will adopt into his family. So what's new here? What is new about this section that warrants us looking? It's not just then that people are adopted and they're welcomed into the household, that they have a standing and a place in the household of God. That then if you're in the household of God, guess what? You have a bunch of brothers and sisters that you are not necessarily biologically connected to at all, or even locationally, circumstantially, nationally, ethnically connected. But the only thing that connects you and the most important is the blood of Christ running through your veins in redemption. It's not just that you have a place in God's household, but it's that God in his beauty and his sovereignty in designing adoption has also promised an inheritance for you. You know what's the beautiful part about inheritance? If we have our minds on right, is that if you have an inheritance, there's something you can look forward to. It's something you can look forward to from your current position as an adopted child of God, that you can look forward to something that he will give to you. And while it's not always the easiest for us to know what earthly inheritances we may or may not get, when God says he's going to give his children inheritance, he's going to give his children inheritance. Why can God deliver? It's because even before we were born, he knew us. Even before we had ever existed, He had already thought of us. That God's children are fearfully and wonderfully made, as Psalm 139 says, and they're chosen as well to be in his household. You know, later on in Ephesians, and this benediction, by the way, it's more than just the opening prayer of blessing. In this benediction, in these 12 verses, you're going to find pretty much all of the themes of Ephesians laid out. Uh, And that's intentional, I'm sure. That Paul was being very clear and how he's going to address all of these things in the rest of his letter. And so he prayed them, and he gave thanks for them. But just later on in Ephesians 2, you'll find that Paul describes the people of God as being God's workmanship. And there's a sense in which he is somebody that is hands-on, that he is shaping, that he is molding, that he is, you know, kind of sharpening and chiseling and kind of smoothing out the person that is in his hands and the people that is in his hands since this letter was addressed to a group of people, not just to one person. And so when God is adopting and then God is giving inheritance, guess what he is doing in the meantime? He is shaping you. He is working on you. He is preparing you for that inheritance that is to come. And so when we think about who we are, if you are in Christ You are adopted, but you're also destined for something great that he has for you, that he made you, and that he shaped you for, and that is this inheritance, this spiritual inheritance, this heavenly inheritance. Now, when you look at how this is worded, you can see it in a couple different ways. One is maybe God is just kind of handing out a bunch of stuff. So you get this, you get this, you get this, and it's almost nameless. But the reason why we say the word inheritance, and that's kind of supported in other places in Ephesians, is because it's much more than just handing out a bunch of stuff. Like he's just, you know, handing out swag somewhere. He had a lot of, you know, things to give away and he was being generous. But it's more like 
the people that he has called and saved, those that he has adopted into his household, he has something particular for them. That there is a spiritual inheritance that he wants to actively give to them. Kind of like how when you are in line in a royal family for the throne, that the person that is in line has this position that is waiting for him or for her. It's not just that anyone could be king or that anyone could be queen, but it's that this was set apart for this person because of their birth order, because of their identity, because of who they are. And the inheritance that we have that God has prepared for his people is in that way, that it was something meant to be given to his children that he has known before you ever existed and that he is giving to you for your joy and for his glory. So why did he do this in verse 12? To the praise of his glory. So that people would praise him, so that people would glorify him, so that people would recognize him, that people would adore him, that people would love him that he is bestowing such favor and kindness on. And we're going to see that very common thread, that everything that God does, we might have our way of making sense of it, but it never goes too much farther from the fact that God does everything for his glory, that he wants his creation to praise him. He wants even his enemies to know who he is in fear, but then praise him. That's who God is. And you are an adopted heir, which allows your identity in this life to be shaped by a future hope and a future inheritance to come. Now, let's go on to the next two verses. This is the two verses where you start seeing the introduction of the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And so the context of this is that in verse 7, What Jesus came to do was to redeem. And redemption is something very particular in that redemption means a one-for-one trade. That you need to give something to redeem the thing that you wanted to take for yourself. And so we gave sin. Christ gave his life. His sacrifice on the cross takes the place and the punishment of God's wrath that we deserve, and then his resurrection from the death allows us to see that God's anger, righteous anger, was satisfied and that he can redeem and that he does redeem sinners. Now, when you see this mention of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit accomplishes two things. The Holy Spirit, one, provides a seal, and the Holy Spirit, two, provides a guarantee. Why might you need a seal and a guarantee? A seal, what it does is it gives authenticity to something. Like if you put your signature on something, if you notarize something, then it's okay. There's a witness, that's you. Okay, You pay someone to do that, or maybe you can do it yourself. That's what a seal does. And the Holy Spirit then, his role is to put a seal on God's promises, both of adoption and redemption. Say, yes, if your faith is in Christ, if you trusted in him, boom, the Holy Spirit stamps that seal. So it's a guarantee of authenticity. But then what is the guarantee then itself? It speaks of it being called a down payment. It's a guarantee of inheritance. So what that means is that there's an inheritance to come, which was mentioned earlier, but that there's a like kind of something that you put in there so that the inheritance will be yours. In other words, it's not up to you to make sure that you get God's inheritance, but that because God has ordained that his children will get his inheritance, that he will make sure of it. And the person the member of the Trinity that accomplishes that is the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit provides himself on your life and on the life of God's people, this down payment and guarantee that God's promises will come to pass. Why might Paul even himself write this and rejoice 
in this. You remember who Paul is. And for you guys that were in the baptism and membership class, we, we looked at even Paul's testimony himself, his calling. That he was called to be this apostle to the Gentiles, but he had a complete 180 transformation when Jesus encountered him on the road to Damascus. And so Paul was faithful and obedient to this mission to proclaim the gospel. But as of the writing of the book of Ephesians, he was in jail. So imagine you have this message that God has given you that you know will set people free, that will bring glory to him, that if you have the boldness and opportunity to speak, then God will be glorified. But where is he? Locked away in a home. He doesn't even know if he will see the next day. Because we don't know if the guards are just. We don't know if the conditions are dangerous. We don't know how strong or weak his body might be. He has no idea what will happen the next day. So how will he fulfill his call? How will he receive the inheritance and the promises of Christ that he received? Well, it's because he trusts and knows that it's the Holy Spirit that will accomplish what God has called him to do. That whether he lives or dies, that he, his life, will glorify God. He doesn't know what will happen the next day, but he doesn't question whether God will accomplish his will through his life. And so this is the circumstances of the author that is writing this benediction. That if he was trying to secure any of God's promises by himself, he has no chance. There is no certainty from his perspective and where he is at. It doesn't matter if he is the greatest apostle of that time or the greatest apostle ever. He's locked away in a house. There's a Roman guard or two just keeping him company. He has nowhere to go. But he knows and trusts in the Holy Spirit to be the one that provides the seal, that provides the guarantee, and that will work, and that will act to accomplish God's purposes through him. If you look at this section starting in verse 13, you'll, you'll notice a change of pronoun. You'll notice that it goes to second person perspective, to where he's writing this benediction, but it's like he's directing everything that was said before from verses 3 to 12 to say, now you, you, you who are reading this letter, who are hearing this letter being proclaimed, you need to remember that the Holy Spirit is the seal and the guarantee of your calling, of your life, of your eternity. You need to know this. You need to remember this. And these people in verse 13 are people that have heard and believed. So they're followers of Jesus. And as a consequence, then they are sealed as well by the work of the Holy Spirit. And then we see in verse 14, what is the purpose of this? It's starting to sound a little familiar, doesn't it? In verse 14, it is to the praise of his glory that the Holy Spirit works in such a certain way, such a secure way, in such a definitive way in the life of God's people so that those that God has ordained and set aside and adopted and redeemed, that they will finish and that they will receive their inheritance. A couple weeks ago, actually it was a week ago now, but uh, we, our family went to Disney World. So this is a picture of us on the last day with our magic bands and we're in front of our room. There's only four of us because we saw Thomas for like two and a half minutes uh, the entire time we were there. Besides his uh, orchestra performance that we sat through, uh, can see him. He was forced back, but um, we <laughs> recorded it all. But the reason why we went is because you know he went to perform with his high school, all the orchestras, the dance troupe, uh, choir, whatever it is. They all went, and so we just thought we'd make a trip out of it because we have a, a semi tradition of going every ten years. I say that because ten years is a really long time, so really this is just our third time, right? So we went on our honeymoon. We went in ten years. Next year's twenty, so then this year's nineteen. So we're like, let's just go. So we went. Now, when I try to make sense of this idea of seal and redemption, not, not to say this is biblical or gospel at all, but, but what kind of connected to me was what you see in front of you, these magic bands, okay, these magic bands. 
But let me tell you a little bit more about that. So if you're staying, or if you're, you know, have admissions to the park, what they do is about three months or four months before, they send you a box. It looks like a really ordinary box. In fact, it's a box that if you're not careful, you just think, this is junk, let me just throw it away. But don't. Expect it three, four months before. Because this stuff is in there. There were four of them in there. Our names are on it, so on and so forth. I wish I brought it, but anyway, I don't remember where I left it now at home. But that's what it is. And, and here's the thing. It's, it's not just a band. It does look pretty. And you can customize it. You can pay over the top to make it even prettier uh, when you're there. But what, what, it's what it allows you to do. Okay, so once you have the magic band, what you can do is you can go into your account, and then you can start doing this. You can start signing up for fast passes for the parks. Like, this is like months in advance. But like, you know, as you're doing your research, you're thinking about, okay, well, what rides are good, you know, blah, blah, blah. You could do that and save your spot on that day. You could also make dinner reservations and so on and so forth. You could also tie a credit card to it. Kind of dangerous. But then anyone that has this, they can just say, hey, charge my you know, whatever, and then they'll charge it. So anyway, we didn't let our kids know any of this, right? But we did have a credit card connected to the band. Anyway. So, but, but that band then, when you're actually on the ground, so you show up, right, from the very get-go, when you get down to, you know, the, the airport, um, if you were staying, you know, at the resorts, then they have a bus that'll take you there. From the beginning, they want you to put on your band, and then they have you scanning through every single thing that happens. They know who you are. They know all your reservations. They know all your rides. And that's actually how you get into every single park from that point forward, is that you actually scan your band, and then you do your fingerprint on there. And then they verify it's you. Your picture comes up, and then you go in. So three months ahead, you're, you're, you're signing up for these rides. I, I didn't do my Disney World research. I'm, I'm not the biggest Disney person. I, I'm okay. But I, I'm okay with that, too. But so I didn't do my research. So Regina did all the reservations, and she did everything. And, uh, you know, she kind of half knew what she was doing, but, you know, we were more interested in the dinner stuff, right, the, the food stuff. But anyway, all these reservations. But you had no idea what was going to happen. You had no idea how long the lines were going to be. You had no idea what the weather was going to be. You had no idea if the park was going to be open or closed. But one thing you knew was that if you had the band and you walked through the turnstile that day and they knew it was you, that unless something really, you know, devastating happens, when it's your turn... <coughs> To get in that fast pass line, you scan it, you're in. I mean, this is like three months ahead when it was so unreal to me. I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know, who cares? But it actually really mattered when it came down to it. On the day of, when people were waiting three hours for a ride, if you had that and you had a reservation and you scanned it, boom, you were in. Same thing with restaurants, same thing with charges that you needed to make. And it was all because of this thing that you've been wearing that then at the moment later gives you access to where you needed to go. Well, this is not the perfect comparison because heaven is much greater than Disney World. But the idea is that when you come to trust in Christ, then the Holy Spirit not only gives you a new heart, but the Holy Spirit also resides in your heart and constantly points you to Jesus, reminds you of the gospel, but then also, because of his presence and his work, guarantees that all of God's promises will come to pass, including every step in your life as he has orchestrated and ordained. Not that your life will be perfect, because if you've been at Disney World long enough, you know that sometimes the weather doesn't cooperate. Sometimes buses break down on you. You know, sometimes, you know, the lines they say are a certain length, but really it's much longer, and sometimes there's... You know, crazy Asian kids running around, that's kind of messing it up for people. You never know. But the thing is that it will get you there if you have the band. Okay? So this is kind of the same idea is that you can, even not knowing all the details that are going to be ahead, you can look and, and hear and receive God's promises for inheritance, for eternity, for the standing as co-regents with Christ. And you can believe that, and you can walk, and you can live, and you can follow Jesus, because the Holy Spirit is your guarantee. The Holy Spirit is active and working. Let's see some of the things that the Holy Spirit will do, even in the book of Ephesians itself. If you look at chapter 2, verse 18, he brings together Jews and Gentiles 
enemies naturally as peoples, but then he resolves conflicts. He brings together relationships, brings about reconciliation. In chapter 2, verses 22 in that passage, the Holy Spirit works to put together pieces that are God's people into a dwelling place where then his presence dwells. That's the church, by the way. That's the local church that all of us, if we're members of a body and we commit to a local church, we're different pieces that God is putting together and that he is building up to be a temple where he dwells. In chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, the mystery of the gospel is revealed through the Holy Spirit. So maybe you came to know the gospel, came to trust in Jesus because someone shared with you. Maybe you read a booklet. Maybe you saw a presentation. Maybe you were like Brandon and you, you know, watched the Paul Washer video. But it was the Holy Spirit that revealed who Christ was to you. It was God's kindness that led you to repentance. And the Holy Spirit was instrumental in that. That if the Holy Spirit wasn't working, you would not repent and believe in Christ. Later on, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the Holy Spirit strengthens you with power in your inner being so that Christ can continue to give you faith and dwell in your hearts. Chapter 4, verses 3 to 4, the Holy Spirit helps to maintain unity in the bond of peace amongst God's people. And we know that even in a church that has the gospel right, people still fight. But the Holy Spirit maintains true unity amongst God's people. If you look later on chapter 4, the Holy Spirit can even grieve. And, and the beauty of this is that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not this force. And I'm pushing this because the trailer came out today. But the Holy Spirit is greater than a force. He is personal. He is active. He is God. And he can be grieved. But he works for you. And he works in you. In chapter 5, the Holy Spirit helps you when you are filled by him to live in ways and in relationships that are honoring and pleasing to him as husband and wife, as parent and child, as boss and employee, that the Holy Spirit changes you and grows you to live in ways that helps you to love and serve others and to bring glory to his name. And then later on in chapter 6, you'll find that we are engaged in spiritual warfare in this world. We may not always see what is going on, but we know that it's happening, that there are forces of evil, that Satan is active. And where is the Holy Spirit in this? The Holy Spirit is our weapon in giving us the word. And the Holy Spirit is the one that fights for us, calling us to prayer and supplication at all times, to trust in him. This is just in the book of Ephesians. All the ways in which the Holy Spirit, he's not just in an inanimate seal on your life, like a really, you know, kind of repetitive, trite, you know, thing on a document that you don't even pay attention to. But the Holy Spirit is a seal because the Holy Spirit is doing all of these things in the life of his people, in the life of God's people. And so because the Holy Spirit is working in us, we will finish and see and receive the inheritance that God the Father has put aside for his people. Now you see then an overarching theme, uh, even in this prayer of 12 verses, that three times alone in this benediction you see to the praise of his glory. All of these things happen to accomplish the greater purpose of not just us having a joyful life, of having a wonderful, loving church, of us having a reputation in a community that is good. All of these things don't happen so that we could be happy and we could be healthy and we could be wise. These things happen, good and trials and all, so that God would be glorified and that he can be praised. I want to share a little bit about this idea here. Okay. So if the inheritance is not now, although, you know, we've been given much and in many ways we've received much, uh, salvation is the greatest gift of all. But if it's not now, if we're in a season that is already but not yet in the fulfillment of God's promises, whether it's our inheritance, whether it's the kingdom in consummation and fullness, if we're not there yet, then as we're thinking even about application and how to live in a way that honors him as college students, as 
young adults as church leaders. Then it helps us then to see how we can understand both blessings in life and judgments in life, or trials or difficulties in life. So if your life is like totally smooth and you're accomplishing every, everything that you've ever wanted to accomplish and you know, all your relationships are great and you know, family's you know, happy and you know, you're meeting all your stepping stones and goals, remember this. You've not arrived. This is not the final destination for the Christian. That we're still a work in progress. That this life is not the end all, but more importantly, we will be disappointed in this life. We should be disappointed in this life as long as sin is not completely vanquished from the earth. However, God will keep his promises. God will keep his promises. In the midst of blessing, we got to look for more. We can't be complacent and comfortable in a blessed life. That's not why we were saved. That's not why the Holy Spirit is guaranteeing something for us in the future. Our best life is not the life that we're living now. And we should never put all of the eggs in the basket of our limited and short earthly life. Don't forget that because most of us, we're not living on the streets. We have opportunities. We have friends. We have many options. But let's not forget our inheritance is not here. So in blessing, we have to look towards eternity and want more. Now, on the flip side would be in your trials and maybe in what are consequences or judgments that God has put in your life. Discipline. Well, if we believe that there is something more to come, that we're in an already but not yet phase, then now is not the worst. Because a greater and more horrific judgment will be coming for the world. This is not the worst, although it always seems like with every season we could find an angle, whether in politics, whether in culture, whether in something that makes it seem like, oh, it's the end of the world and so bad. It's going to be worse because ultimately God will come and judge sin. That is bad. And everyone needs deliverance from that. Everyone needs deliverance from the ultimate judgment and from the ultimate wrath of God. And this is not a joke. This is not just throwing hell out there to scare people. This is what the Bible teaches. And so no matter how bad life is now, it's not the worst. And no matter how bad life is now, our inheritance is not here. Our inheritance lies ahead if you are in Christ. So how I want us to close is for you guys in your community groups just to be able to share from the position of where you're at in life, what it looks like to live a life of purpose that brings praise and glory to God as a collegian on your campus, in your relationships, in home and outside, and also with your family. God is not done with you even though we don't always see very far. And so I want to encourage you guys in your community groups to get down to the level of how can I take the next steps to bring praise and glory to God with my actions, with my life, with my church community, with my family, with my work, with my school. You don't need to come up with answers for all of them. Just pick one. Just pick one, because that's why God has even set all of this into motion. Why he has adopted sinners who are redeemed by the work of his son. Why the Holy Spirit is working and active in the lives of often resistant people. Why? To the praise of his glory. So every little thing that we do that is for his glory is worth it and will last. And everything that we choose away from that we're settling for less. So let's pray. And then we'll break up into our groups and, and let's talk and let's pray about how we can do that. Now, Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for you being the one that initiates 
the plan of salvation that adopted sinners into your household, that redeems broken people through the humble and powerful work of your son. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave it there, that being a Christian is just about looking back. But, Lord, being a Christian is anchoring our hope on what has happened so that we can persevere through this life into inheritance, into eternity, into what you have for us in the heavenly places that you prepared for your children. So God, help us to respond. Help us to take that next step in obedience. Help us to take that next step and bring praise and glory to your name. Nothing is too small when it is done with that intent. And thank you, Lord, that those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, we don't deserve it, we know. But God, that you've done everything to allow us to be here to continue to grow. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.